there's something chilling about cold cases. The impact of a murder or disappearance mixed with the uncertainty of not knowing what happened is a tragic combination that leaves the victim's memory in a limbo of emotions. Many families never actually put the tragedy to rest, haunted by the thoughts and questions of how their loved one met their final moments. But like we've seen many times before on this channel, forensics is leaping forward when it comes to DNA testing of cold cases, and every day, new connections are being made that bring light to cases that went cold decades ago. Today we're travelling back in time to the 70s, and revisiting four cold cases which after years of being filed away in a cabinet, can now finally be considered solved. On October 6th of 1977, a woman was reported missing by her boyfriend. Linda LeBeau was nowhere to be found, and four days after being reported missing, her car turned up on the freeway, with her personal belongings still inside. Linda's maiden name was Linda Dernal, and she was born on April 10th, 1950, in San Gabriel, California. She was fun and easygoing, and made friends wherever she went. By the time she was in her 20s, she had a job, her own apartment, and loved spending time sailing and water skiing. She also enjoyed car races, which she would attend with her brother. In one of those races, she met Philip LeBeau, a man ten years older than her. The two clicked and started going out on dates very soon. Linda's family remember him as being a nice man at first. He didn't have a steady job or a lot of money, but he was nice to Linda, and the two had fun together. After six months of dating, the couple got married. Linda was Philip's third wife, and quickly became his children's stepmother. However, shortly after getting married, problems began. Philip was controlling, and he started being abusive towards her. Four years after getting married, the couple got a divorce and parted ways. Linda began dating a co-worker and rebuilding her life, while Philip began seeing someone new as well. However, he never really got over the fact that Linda left him and became fixated with her. On more than one occasion, Philip broke into Linda's house and stole things from her. He also slashed her new boyfriend's tires and even poured sugar into his gas tank. Philip was sending a clear message. If you can't be happy with me, you can't be happy with anyone. On October 6th of 1977, Linda was supposed to meet Philip at a restaurant to get money from him to repair the damages he'd caused to her boyfriend's car. After that, she was seen at a gas station with an unidentified male. Although this companion has never been officially identified, it's very possible it was Philip. A witness stated they saw the two arguing, and at one point she tried to drive away, hitting the witness's car on the way. She then tried to run off, but the unidentified male caught up to her, and the two came back to the gas station. The witness sensed something wasn't quite right, so they provided their contact information to Linda, in case she needed help. That was the last time anyone saw Linda LeBeau. After finding her car on the side of the road with all her personal belongings, police ruled out a runaway. However, there didn't seem to be a struggle, and despite searching the area, Linda was never found. Philip was investigated, since news of his abuse and break-ins were well known among Linda's friends and family. After questioning his new girlfriend and other witnesses, they discovered Philip came home later than usual on October 6th, and he was wearing different clothes than the ones he wore when he left the house in the morning. His hair was also wet. When questioned about this, he told investigators he'd stopped for a swim on the way home, and had to change so as not to get the car wet. Without a body, and no other evidence pointing at him, there was little police could do. For decades, Linda's disappearance haunted the Dernal family, who refused to give up. But no leads ever came up, and despite keeping a close watch on Philip, the case grew colder and colder. In 1986, skeletal remains were discovered in an embankment near Lake Elsinore in California. The skull was analyzed and determined to belong to a woman who had been shot in the head. All signs pointed at a shot fired by someone else, making it very possible this was a homicide. However, this Jane Doe's remains were not connected to any missing persons cases open in the area. They matched no descriptions and gave no further clues as to who the mysterious woman was. Her remains were archived and remained untouched for over two decades, until 2021. 
In August of 2021, the Cold Case Homicide Team and Riverside County Coroner exhumed several sets of skeletal remains from cold cases, including Jane Doe's skull. After extensive DNA testing, a positive match was found for her. A family in California had submitted DNA samples in 2007 with the hope of someday finding a missing family member, a woman named Linda Lebeau, who'd been missing since 1977. When contacted and tested again, the match seemed to be unquestionable. Linda Lebeau had been killed sometime in 1977, and her remains had possibly been tossed into the lake. Despite finding Linda, police still had to find the killer. Although Philip Lebeau was still the main suspect in the case, he passed away in 2008, and investigators were not able to further question him. In cases like these, the handling of domestic abuse comes into question. In 1977, victims hardly had any protection from authorities. An abusive partner was something you just had to put up with. If Linda had received the help she needed, the ending of this tragic story would have probably been very different. One of the most famous cold cases from the 70s is the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders. This controversial case began in 1977, when three young girls had just arrived at Camp Scott in Mays County, Oklahoma. Their names were Lori Farmer, Michelle Goose, and Doris Milner, and they were 8, 9, and 10 years old. The first night, June 12th, the girls got ready for bed in tent number 8, the tent the three would be sharing during the two weeks they'd spend at camp. The next morning, at 6 o'clock, one of the camp counselors was on her way to the showers, when there, in the middle of the trail, she spotted something horrifying. The bodies of three young girls. She quickly identified them. It was Lori, Michelle and Doris, the three girls from Tent 8. Authorities rushed to the scene, and by 7am they were looking into what appeared to be a murder investigation. The three girls had been assaulted, and then strangled to death. While the rest of the Girl Scouts at the camp were sent home, investigators analyzed the scene for evidence. Blood was found on the floor of tent number 8, where the victims were staying, as well as a shoe print and fingerprints on various objects. Another one of the camp's counselors came forward with information too. A few weeks before, when they were conducting a training session at the camp, she went back to her tent to find someone had been through her things. Among her belongings, she had brought a box of donuts. The box was now empty and inside she found a note that said, We are on a mission to kill three girls in Tent 1. When she shared the note with the camp director, they discarded it as a prank and never reported it to the police. It seemed that someone had been eyeing the camp for weeks, waiting for the moment to strike, and as soon as the girls had arrived, they had gone through with their threat. After investigating the area, police located a cave where someone had apparently been staying, a pair of glasses had been found, which belonged to one of the camp's counsellors, as well as a torn newspaper and a photo of two women. Part of the torn newspaper had been found at the scene, inside the battery compartment of a flashlight found near the bodies. When investigating the women in the photographs, they were identified as part of a photography course given to inmates. After questioning a couple of persons of interest, police finally revealed they were trying to find a potential suspect who had taken the course and in fact developed those photos a man named Jean Hart. Jean had escaped from prison in 1973, where he had been serving a sentence for burglary, kidnapping, and assault. He was believed to be in the area at the time, but it took police almost a year to find him and arrest him. In 1979, the trial against Jean Hart began, and all the controversies in the evidence were pointed out by the defense. The footprint found at the scene wasn't the same size as Hart's feet. The fingerprint on the flashlight was not a match to him and all other physical evidence, such as blood, hair, and semen samples, were inconclusive. The technology to prove whose DNA it was simply didn't exist yet. The defense also argued the sheriff was trying to avenge Hart's escape from prison and wanted to pin the murders on him any way he could. Although there was evidence that did point at Hart being the culprit, the jury found him not guilty. Gene Hart was sent to prison regardless, since he had to complete his previous sentences, which were already granting him life in prison but the murders remained unsolved. Just days after re-entering prison, Jean Hart died of a heart attack while working out in the prison's courtyard. He was 35 years old, and with his death, the hopes the family had of an appeal and of finding out the truth were gone with him. 
until recently. In May of 2022, further testing of several blood samples found in the girl's tent determined Jean Hart was definitely there, and strongly point the finger at his involvement. Although none of it can be confirmed, especially not after his death, it is almost proven that Jean Hart was indeed the killer. A killer who was almost caught, and got away with it simply because of a technological impediment of the time. In 1978, 15-year-old Marissa Rolf Harvey's life took an unexpected turn. She'd just discovered she had a sister she didn't know about. Marissa had been adopted at the age of three and never knew her biological family, but just after Christmas, a visitor in her 30s had come to her door in Port Washington, New York, and announced she was her older biological sister. This new discovery made Marissa very excited to learn more about her family. Her sister lived in San Francisco, and she asked her parents if she could go visit. Although the Harveys weren't too happy with the idea, they decided they'd let her go on her own anyway, and asked her sister to watch over her. And so in March of 1978, Marissa flew from New York to San Francisco and spent a weekend with her sister, getting to know one another and learning about their biological family. After a fun weekend, and with a little time in her hands before she had to go back to the airport, Marissa asked her sister if she could drop her off at the stables, since she wanted to go horseback riding. Her sister did as she asked, and drove her to the stables with the idea of picking her up after a few hours. However, when she came back for her, it turned out the stables had been closed that day, and Marissa was nowhere to be found. After searching for her with no results, she reported her missing right away. The next day, Marissa's body was found about half a mile away from where she was dropped off by her sister. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled. Despite investigators being quick to search the area and find Marissa's body, there was nothing else they could do to explain what could have happened to the teenager. The little evidence and clues they found led only to dead ends, and soon after the investigation began, it went cold. For 43 years, the death of Marissa Harvey remained a mystery, and the family had to live with the pain of not knowing what happened to their daughter. But in 2020, cold case units revisited Marissa's case, and in 2021, a new lead finally came up. Thanks to DNA profiling from samples recovered in Marissa's case, police managed to identify a new suspect, Mark Stanley Personette. Despite this still being an ongoing investigation, police feel very strongly about this lead, and Personnet has been arrested. He is also currently being investigated in other cold cases to determine if he's connected to more unsolved cases. Although Marissa Harvey's story is still developing, this new lead brings hope to the case, and brings it one step closer to finally being solved. On July 24th of 1979, a young woman came home after work to the apartment she shared with her sister in Portland, Oregon. It was 10 p.m. and the apartment was quiet. Too quiet. She called out for her sister but got no response, even though the lights were on and it looked like someone was home. She went looking for her and just as she stepped into her sister's bedroom, she found her, dead on the floor, with signs of strangulation and definitely having been sexually assaulted. The victim was Anna Marie Hlavka, a 20-year-old young woman with her whole life ahead of her. She and her sister both worked at a nearby McDonald's and had moved in together to start their lives away from home. Anna was sweet, she had a big sincere smile, and she was just working hard to save money. The bizarre murder caught everyone off guard. She had no criminal background, she wasn't involved in anything suspicious, she didn't have any enemies, and there were no jealous ex-boyfriends in the picture. So, what happened that night? Police investigated the crime scene in hopes to find clues that would explain who would attack Anna like this. But despite analyzing blood samples and interviewing dozens of witnesses, all the leads would fade within days. All they knew was that Anna was last seen entering her apartment at 5pm. Five hours later, her sister found her dead inside their home. It would take four decades for the Oregon police to find and follow a new lead, and it was all thanks to DNA and thanks to Anna. During her attack, Anna fought back hard, and along the way she managed to scratch her attacker, 
Samples of DNA were recovered from under her nails and stored away, unable to use them in the 70s when this case took place. However, in 2009 these samples were sent to a crime lab in hopes that the forensics advances that were proving to be of help in solving cold cases could shine a light on this one as well. It would take another decade before investigators could identify the unknown male's DNA found under Anna's fingernails. But in early 2019, a match was finally found. The new lead was Jerry McFadden, a man with a serious record of criminal activities. There were just two problems. McFadden was famous for his crimes in Texas, not Oregon, and in 1999 he had been executed. So how did a well-known criminal, with a recurring record in Texas, kill Anna all the way in Portland? Investigators never had him in their radar as a potential suspect, so as soon as he was identified, they looked into his record to try and put together the puzzle the DNA results had just put before them. Jerry McFadden was born in 1948 in Texas. Nicknamed The Animal and body covered in tattoos, he stares intently into the camera in one of his arrest photos. McFadden's criminal record started in 1972, when he was convicted of two counts of rape and sentenced to 15 years in prison. However, after only six years, he was paroled. In June of 1979, one month before Anna's murder, he kidnapped and assaulted another Texas woman. In October of 1979, he was arrested for violating his parole and sentenced to life. But once again, he surprisingly got paroled after serving only six years of what was meant to be a life sentence. In May of 1986, three young friends were spending the night at a local lake when McFadden, also known as the Animal, kidnapped the man and two women. All three were found dead, and one of the women had also been sexually assaulted. McFadden was arrested and charged with the three murders, but in July of 1986, as he awaited trial, McFadden knocked out a sheriff's deputy and kidnapped a woman who worked as a dispatcher and jailer. He held a woman hostage at gunpoint and put her in a boxcar outside the rail yards for hours. However, she managed to escape, and McFadden was eventually caught hiding in an abandoned house nearby. In 1999, he was executed in Texas. So when did McFadden travel all the way to Portland? Investigators found the crimes of the animal extended beyond Texas, and after interviewing surviving family members, they learned that in 1979, McFadden had traveled with a woman he knew to the Pacific Northwest, a trip that would have put him in Oregon at the time when Anna was murdered. However, the motive doesn't seem to be personal, as it never did in any of McFadden's other crimes. The random choice of his victim meant police had no way to connect the two names, and therefore never found an explanation to who killed Anna. As it tends to happen in these cases, the family are far from reaching any closure, especially since the killer died so many years ago. But the bittersweet news does answer some questions, and at least explains who took Anna's life all those years ago. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you found it interesting to support the channel and so you don't miss any new updates.